that metal was made for the third location show in a row I might add now for tonight's program we're going to be on location at Milton Keynes Bowl there it is you can see it right behind me and we are bringing you Metallica Meltdown yes all the action from this great gig that's really taken over from Donington Monsters of Rock this year we are talking interviews and live performances with Diamond Head the Almighty, Megadeth, and of course, headliners, Metallica. So this is the show that's always more than Metallica, Headbangers Ball. something truly fucking special so uh as you know there's a band who lives just up the road in Stour Bridge who's meant a lot to uh, Metallica back in the early days and uh we actually have all four of them here tonight for the first time ever together since uh, 1983 when they played Donington and shit like that so uh it's gonna give me great pressure to bring these guys up here in a second for the first time together, like I said, in eight years to play two songs that we've covered of theirs that you might just about fucking know. So how about a big hometown, hometown fucking hand for the guys up from Stour Bridge. This is Duncan and Colin and Brian and Sean of Diamond Head, huh? Come on. There's one of them. There's two of them. There's three of them. Oh my God, look at that shit, huh? On the ugly ones. Huh? Fuck yeah, I never thought I'd live to see this fucking day, huh? All right, you got a mic? You got another one? Dude, yeah. Double this fist? Be, Very special mic, <laughs> Hello, all right. There's a lot of people on stage, isn't there? <laughs> now, which way am I facing? All right. All right, then. Okay, what we want to know is... Are you evil? Well, are you fucking evil, you lot?
Diamond Head, The Almighty, Megadeth and Metallica. What a great lineup! And we're kicking off our coverage of the festivities at Milton Keynes Bowl, headlined of course by Metallica, by travelling a few miles away from the venue to the slightly more sort of serene and relaxed surroundings of uh, Great Linford Manor. And uh, that's where Diamond Head are celebrating their opening slot on the bill and of course the release of their new album, Death and progress and I'm joined by Brian and Hello. Sean right next to me. Now uh, I guess I should say to you guys how are you doing because Brian you've actually been a little bit poorly recently haven't you? You've had shingles. How yeah. are you today? Yeah, I'm not too bad today. I, I'm, I, I played fine on Thursday night at the underground. You had a bit of a wor warm-up gig. Yeah I, I just wanted to see if I could play all right and uh, it seemed fine so I'm going to be great today. The yeah. crowd seems to lift you. Of course. You know once, once I realize I can play in the sound check uh, that sort of gave me a bit of confidence, but the crowd definitely lift you up. Good. And of course, I'll, I'll leave all the <laughs> running about to Sean. <laughs> Sean. So right. I can just concentrate on uh, my fretboard. So what I'll are well. good, good. good. So what are your feelings on the gig today? Because it's probably not the biggest show you've ever played, but it's probably the it most is important. The it, it is, is the, biggest. the biggest. The only other big show of this size was... Uh, Donington. Donington 83, mm -hmm. which was... Uh, with Whitesnake, and I would imagine when we were on first band about two o'clock, we're probably about 35,000, 40,000. Right. Hopefully, there's going to be 60,000 here today. Brilliant. How are you feeling about it, Sean? Well, it's just a really important gig for us to do, you know. It's a great honour to be up there after all this time to come back and uh, sort of start again right at the top. Absolutely. Yeah. With a bang. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think is the greatest challenge about playing today? Well, obviously, opening. Mm -hmm. We opened it before at Donington, and that, that was really hard. You know, mm -hmm. uh, just it's, people are so are cold in the mm -hmm. afternoon. It's, it, it's a month before five o'clock in the afternoon, but mm -hmm. it's, I think to most people it feels like about seven o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning when the first band comes on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the challenge is to compete with all these bands that have been on the tour and uh, sorry on the road mm -hmm. and making albums for the last uh, what, ten years. Ten years, and we've, we've been sort of doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you think it's also a chance to show fans that may not be that familiar with you the diversity of Diamond Head? Because Metallica, yeah. covering some of your songs, has may maybe given them a one-dimensional view of what Diamond Head's about. That's a good point, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, yeah. We yeah. are quite diverse. It's been nice, but well done. Okay. All right, well, we're going to talk some more to Sean and Brian in just a moment. But I right now... I might say now, something then, yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Right now, by the miracles of modern television, we're going to fast forward to about half past four this afternoon and we're going to see Diamond Head live on stage at Milton Keynes Bowl. Can we watch? You can. Trucking!
available on location in the slightly more relaxed surroundings of Great Linford Manor with Diamond Head and Sean and Brian are still here to answer some more questions and we talk a little bit about your new album Death and Progress. Now you guys have kind of been promising a comeback for probably just about over two years. Why has it taken so long? Albums take that long to record these <laughs> days. I wish they'd take t 10 days or two mm. weeks uh, or we could go and make like uh, Elvis's first record, you know, on the Sun label when he just goes in as a jam for a few times mm -hmm. and there you got history in the making, but uh, rock albums seem to seem to take a long time these mm -hmm. days. The drag on. Has it changed a lot from when you were recording, you know, ten years ago? Yeah, the first album took about seven days, the second album about <laughs> three weeks, the third about two and a half months, and this one mm -hmm. took about five months to record. <laughs> really? What, what has taken I don't know the time? What, I don't know, I mean, it's just going to different studios, uh, organising things, rehearsing, oh, doing different songs. Mm -hmm. You just end up uh, wasting time, you know. <laughs> We're concerned with objectivity though as well, so you, sometimes you need space mm -hmm. and time in yeah. between the recording mm -hmm. and the making of the album to actually get back home and sort of be objective about the music you're making mm -hmm. again, you know, because you don't just want to, you know, just do it and not think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're pretty careful, not too careful. <laughs> Still we're some care spontaneity there, isn't yeah. there? Mark? We're careful about what sort of songs are classed as a Diamond End album. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're lucky enough to be able to do the album in Birmingham this time, mm -hmm. so we could drive home every home night and, and yeah. uh, play it on Sean's little Walkman <laughs> thing. And Home's where the heart is. Now you also had some special guests on the album as well. Could you tell us a little bit about who contributed and what, what you think they, they brought to the album? Brian can give us the Tony okay, story. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Tony Home is on the first track. Tony! 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 <laughs> One of our heroes. Symptom of the universe and hole in the sky and all that. So, um, t w they said, do you want to write a song with Tony Home? And of course we said, yeah. And we went round his house and put some riffs together. And, and that was really great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And make it sound exciting, Brian, as well. <laughs> well I'm, I'm a bit under the weather. He's a bit under know. the weather, so, uh, hold up. You. Dave Mustaine. You did the Dave Mustaine. Well. Mr. Mustaine. Oh, well. Dave Mustaine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Dave Mustaine. Well, uh, he played guitar. Yeah, he played guitar. He does play guitar. Yeah. Well, no, right. on your record. Though. <laughs> yeah, he did. He uh, produced one of the tracks. Yeah, as well. he wasn't going to uh, actually play guitar. He actually phoned phoned me and said, uh, "Would you like some guitar <laughs> on this record?" I said, "Just please, as much as you like. You know, <laughs> just do it." Uh, you pleased with the result? Yeah, of course. I expected Dave to do. What Dave does, you know, mm -hmm. some radical, some are tough. Mm -hmm. he, he he calls it that uh, killer tone. Mm -hmm. Is what he calls it. So uh, we wanted a bit of that, and he gave it to us. So, right on, Dave. Nice one. Well, it's been ten years since your last album. Um, do you think that you've taken up where you left off, or do you think that you've kind of had to reinvent the band and its sound? I think the band has reinvented itself. Uh, it's different having different yeah. players in yeah. the band to give it a different angle. Carl's done a really good job of the drums, the bass is, is a different style to what we normally had. Well I think you're right, we've had to, we've had to sort of define what we were capable of doing mm. because with the last album, uh, the Canterbury record, we, we tried too hard to be too much too yeah. soon. Mm -hmm. So with this one we were well aware that we couldn't afford to do that because we at least had to finish a good record, you mm. know, and for it to have a, a focus of yeah. some description, okay. which I think we achieved, I hope. Good. All right, then, well, we'll talk some more about the album Death and Progress, but right now we are going to show you some more live performance from Diamond Head. The dogs are howling and the night is black and not to touch To hold up that fire burning flame of love And when the darkness comes like a day for a song
talk to Diamond Head before we head off down to the Milton Keynes Bowl to uh, join, I guess, about 60,000 other metalheads enjoying the sunshine and, of course, the great lineup headlined by Metallica. And Sean and Brian are still with me. And uh, a couple more questions, quickly got time for. Um, what lessons and experience that you learned last time around do you think that you, you've put into good effect for this record? Because you, I know you had some like record company problems yeah. and stuff. I think basically to just go with what we know, you know, go with our experience, go with our instincts mm -hmm. and uh, try and be as honest to ourselves as we possibly can because uh, in the earlier days we were a bit naive and were a bit uh, push me, pull me anyway, you know. We'd go whichever, whichever way anybody sent. If somebody sent us down the King's Road to buy some silly shirts, <laughs> <laughs> we'd do it, you know. Where and did where, you, where did these come oh, from? Oh, these are my own fault. That, <laughs> only me, I, sort of, I can be blamed for those. It's also important to have some good people around you as well, isn't it? Because um, it seems that yeah. the experience I've had of the people that are working with you now, they seem really yes. on the case. Yeah, they really, they, they really care, care about mm -hmm. Diamond Head and care about the legacy. That, not only that we left, but hopefully the new one that we're trying to uh, invent. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you know, yeah, caring's the theme, caring's the key. Good. Yeah. Lyrically, um, are you kind of still inspired by the same things that you were sort of 10 years ago? Or do you think that because you're obviously a mature, older person, do you think that you've changed from that point of view? Uh, I think I was inspired initially by language, mm -hmm. in English language, uh, and, and then poetry. Mm -hmm. And when I did my early lyrics on the uh, band's albums, it was more sci-fi and uh, you know strange surreal stuff mm -hmm. and I think I've, I've developed just just I've got back to the simplicity of enjoying language again mm -hmm. uh, uh, inspiration just comes where it comes doesn't it mm -hmm. okay. it's not as simple as it was in the old days. <laughs> and Brian what are your plans after this great show at Milton Keynes have you got any more tour dates or anything he's like going to go to bed <laughs> yeah uh, Try and get get rid of me. Uh, <coughs> His sunglasses. That's my immediate plan. <laughs> and then um, hopefully we'd like to do some more shows. Uh, I don't know if we'll get anything as high profile as this one. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we'll play the back garden here. Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. That's such a great place. Maybe we can do two nights at Dudley JB's. <laughs> the Linford Manor Lawn gig. <laughs> That'd be cool. I want to come to that one. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for joining me on this special day. Thank and you very much. I want to wish you all the best for this afternoon and, of course, your new album, Death and Progress. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, nice hope one. to see you again soon. And right now, we are going to take our first short break. Then, after that, we'll be back over, we'll be going down to the Milton Keynes Bowl and yeah. we'll be meeting up with the next band on the bill, The Almighty. And, of course, we'll have some more live performances for you as the Headbangers Ball from Metallica, Milton Keynes Bowl continues. Stage at the Milton Keynes Bowl to meet the next band on the bill. Just a little earlier there you saw Diamond Head and now it's time to meet the second band playing here today supporting Metallica and that is The Almighty and I'm joined by Ricky and Pete. So how are you guys doing? Very well. Good, Thanks. Good, lovely day for it isn't it? <laughs> for what? For, lovely day for what? <laughs> for playing a gig. For playing a gig, right, okay. Perfect. Definitely. Now uh, I know you guys are big fans of uh, Alice in Chains and obviously they were playing here um, before you got you got the gig, how did you feel when you were told that they'd had to cancel and you'd got the slot? Um, obviously, we were disappointed for them, you know. But at the end of the day, we were, you know, really, really happy because it's a great opportunity for us. Um, you know, it'd been great if they could have been, we could have been on the bill as well as Alice in Chains, but uh, you know, things happen. And so, Pete, now this is kind of like playing um, Donington two years running, isn't it? Because you were on stage last August in Donington and there's no Donington this year, so how do you feel about that? Um, I feel really good because that means two years in a row for this style of music we're pretty much playing the most important outdoor show of the summer. Um, it's really unfortunate that Donington doesn't happen this year because it's kind of become a tradition, but um, this is kind of taking the place of it, so we're obviously really pleased. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations. Now, how um, do you feel about going on the Metallica diamond-shaped stage? Um, I went out before the doors were opened and had a bit, had a bit of a walk around it. It's, um, it's a bit weird, it's very, very big and there's a lot of ramps and stuff, so uh, it'll be interesting. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. 
Now you guys have been on tour with Iron Maiden and I know that you played a lot of places that you hadn't been to before. How did that go? That was brilliant. We went well, we went to Italy, which we've never been before, and the reaction there was totally amazing. I mean, the crowds just went berserk. That was great. We also played down in the south of France, which we've never been down there before. And it was, the whole tour actually was, was, was very good. Good. Now when you played Donington last year, Pete was new to the band. You were just about to go and record an album. Do you now feel that you're much better equipped for this show, this particular show? Um, yeah, actually, yeah. I feel a lot more um, comfortable with it. Um, I'm nervous today, but I was about five times as nervous at Donington. Just, yeah, you know, having an album under the belt with myself and the band and stuff. Eh, I feel Lots of touring experience. Yeah, the Iron Maiden tour did a lot for that as well, you know. I feel very much settled in and, and a part of it now. Okay, well we're going to talk to Ricky and Pete lots, lots more, but right now we're going to show you some live performance from the Almighty right here at Milton Keynes.
starting up here on this special edition of the Headbangers Ball from Milton Keynes with Metallica and of course all their support bands and uh, the weather is really hotting up now it's pretty hot here backstage and uh, as you can see I'm still with Ricky and Peach from The Almighty and uh, I was going to ask you a little bit about the uh, current album Power Tripping do you feel that criticisms of the album kind of following the Seattle trend are unfounded? Um, yeah, very much so. It seems to be that when you try a different tuning on the guitar or you try something a little bit different, suddenly now people say, oh, you're trying to force the Apple sound. That's not the case at all. We just, you know, when we wrote the songs, nothing was contrived. We just, you know, whatever we wanted to, to do, we did. And, uh, you know, sure, we listened to a lot of stuff from there. And obviously, whatever you listen to has got to bear some influence on you. But it wasn't a case of like, God, we've got to suddenly, you know, get this out. I don't even know what it is. You know, to no. me, all these bands that come out of there are really good. and. and and to be put into another category like grunge or Seattle category, it just sucks, you know. But there's so grunge. much diversity on your album. There's probably only two songs that sort of follow that that kind of style, anyway. So exactly, exactly. That's what I think. I think these people just are trying to find an excuse to put us and other bands down as well. You know, it's, if you look hard enough, you're going to be able to compare everything to anything. I mean, that's what I think. They're just looking for an excuse to insult people. <laughs> Now, um, the new single, or the current single, Out of Season, um, showed a slightly kind of softer side to the almighty. Was that supposed yeah, you, you to said, be... You said we look like Delamitri. <laughs> <laughs> Was that supposed to be in like a complete contrast to, to the way you looked and sounded in addiction? Yeah, totally. You know, I think this, it just showed another side to the band. That, and, you know, we can write the really heavy stuff, but there's also be, there's a bit of a softer side to us. And, uh, yeah, we, wanted, we didn't want to make two videos that looked the same, so... Uh, Yes, is the answer to that question. Good. Yes, there you go. Now, the B-sides that were recorded um, to go on, on, those, uh, on the single, um, do they kind of show the band's influences and roots? Because there's some quite varied uh, stuff there, isn't there? Definitely, yeah. I mean, we're only going to do cover versions that we like by bands that we like. And we're all huge Neil Young fans. Um, myself and Stumpy are very big fans of The Ruts and you know, Pete and Floyd Lincoln as well. So it was really easy to pick two songs, you know, by those said people to cover. But why, why are you such a big fan of, of say, Neil Young? Because he's God. <laughs> simple answer to a simple question. He just Great, rules. Incredibly, incredibly good songs and really strong lyrics. That's brilliant. Okay. Well, we'll talk to Ricky and Pete some more, but uh, we've got some more music on the way for you right now. And, of course, we're going to show you some more live performance from The Almighty. Don't you? And you pay. 
at Milton Keynes Bowl and we're in the little uh, artist's dressing room area and as you can see actually if we have a little look around it's not particularly large here and there are three bands here I think Metallica have their own little separate bit over there somewhere but anyway uh, Ricky and Pete from the Almighty are still with me few more moments to talk and uh, Ricky I understand there's a problem um, with the album cover for Power Trippin and that you've been forced to make a few small changes what's the story there? Well, yeah unfortunately we found out it's like a copyright infringement on the, the cover that, we, that we've got at the minute and uh, as from the 22nd of June in North America and the rest of the world we've, we've had to change the cover. It's not drastically different, there's uh, a sort of colour has been added to and it's been distorted a bit but uh, we, fortunately we had to do it so there's nothing we could do about it. Okay. But it's quite a departure from your kind of famous skull sure. logo, why did you decide to move away from that? Well, there's so many changes last year with Pete coming in and uh, you know song sounding a bit different and just a whole different new vibe with the band we wanted to sort of you know show people that you know we're not going to sort of stick with the same thing the whole way through we wanted to something a bit different this time around and uh, hence the, the album cover okay i'm um, talking a little bit about the songwriting um i know that you found it a lot easier to write the music this time and that the lyric the lyrics for power tripping didn't come easily to you why do you think that is um, lyrics never really come easy to me um, because I just don't like really writing something that's really straightforward. I like making plays on words and stuff like that. The music was a lot quicker because we had this guy mm -hmm. who I could get together with um, you know, a couple of times a week and we basically got the music together between us and then the rest of the band arranged it.
Well, we have a few weeks off after this, right? And we're actually, um, we've already got some ideas we're working on that might be used as B-sides or we might end up saving them for the next album, but we don't want to get caught coming off the next tour, you know, and all of a sudden, my God, you got to come to, you come up with 12 songs. We want to, you know, basically make really good use of the time that we do have while we're out on tour, so we have a, a good, strong sort of um, stockpile of stuff by the time the tour is done. But is it a constant pressure on you to keep coming up with songs? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Okay. It's, uh, you know, writing songs is like, you know, it really does. You go through hell trying to get the end result, but, you know, it's worth it in the end. Okay, well, we're going to have another short break right now on the Headbangers Ball. Good luck to these guys this afternoon and with the uh, upcoming tour dates. And uh, we'll go into that break now. After that, we're going to be back with the next band on the bill. You know who it is, Megadeth. So see you there. Backstage again at Milton Keynes at the Metallica show and next up tonight we're going to meet the band who are uh, going on just before Metallica actually and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Dave Mustaine from Megadeth and uh, Dave unlike the other bands we've interviewed we interviewed them before they went on the stage we're now talking to you after the gig so I have to ask you how did it go for you tonight? It went. <laughs> But you didn't have to do very much singing because everybody was singing for you. It was brilliant. Yeah, I, I noticed that. That was really cool. Um, I appreciate that because it lets me uh, earn more money for less work. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's great to see you looking so well and on such fine form. And, you know, I have to ask you, there's been like a lot of rumors and a lot of talk about problems with, with you going back to, to like drugs and alcohol abuse and everything. What, what's, what, what's happened there? Well, there was a period where um, I kind of had some trouble and that that's about three months and a day behind me you know um, things were just really tough for us in the United States we had some problems with uh, touring and such and I was really lonely missed my wife and my son a lot and, and um, one drink turned into a couple of drinks and, and I'd always said that you know there's a chance on down the road that I'll have a drink and, and you know what I did and um, you know, I'm alive I, I'm doing well and, and you know what I, I you know I can't say I'll never drink again still but I know for right now today I'm, I'm feeling better than I ever have I mean how are you coping um, with with those pressures because because your career must put so many pressures on you it must be like a like a double-edged short sword like salvation or destruction yeah it's, it's like having it's like having a truck parked on your balls the pressure it just it's excruciating Sometimes, you know, I was really thinking about not playing anymore because uh, my personal health and my relationship with my wife and son is more important to me than, than uh, you know, making money and, and uh, playing on tour. You know, I love giving music to people and I would just as soon make albums and, and let people hear it that way than try and kill myself and end up overdosing because of being on tour for too long. You know, because it's very lonely out here. It, it gets really, really lonely. Yeah. That so is if you have a life. <laughs> you know. So do you think this, this last sort of episode has helped you to maybe put things in perspective a bit more? Well, it's improved things with the band. We've gotten closer again. <laughs> Every time I relapse, we get better. So hopefully we'll, this is the best we'll have to get. You know, I, I don't want to keep having to go in and out of hospitals just to make the band improve because it's uh, very taxing on my body. So do you think that um, having your wife and your family and having a, a, like a stable background has, has been the thing to really pull you through this time and maybe keep you hopefully on the straight and narrow? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I, I know one thing is for certain that, that having them in my life has definitely made me a lot happier of a lot of the things that I used to uh, take for granted. Okay, well, we'll talk to Dave a lot more, and of course, in the next segment, we're going to talk about the Megadeth music, and uh, we're going to show you a little bit of the band live on stage here at Milton Keynes.
will be returning to Megadeth very shortly. We've got a little commercial break on the way. But before we go into that, I'd just like to introduce you to somebody who has no doubt been enjoying the show here today, and that is King Diamonds. How are you doing? Have you had a good time today? Very much so, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Now, uh, we were at the Dynamo Festival where you headlined a couple of weekends ago. How did that go for you, King? Because I know that you had a little bit of a, a sore throat. You weren't able to do the interview with us. How did the gig go for you? Uh, I managed to get through it, but it was very <laughs> much because of the audience, because they gave a lot uh, of energy, you know, and all this stuff. And I needed to press so hard with the muscles and everything just to get the right notes out. And it was, it was tough, but... Uh, if there hadn't been so many and that crazy there, the audience, it would have been a hard time for me. Because just prior to that, of course, you played with Metallica in Copenhagen. Yeah. And uh, was that like a, a really good lifetime ambition for you to play with Metallica? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, it was great. And then in Denmark, you know, in front of a home audience. And uh, even though we played at uh, four in the afternoon, broad daylight and everything, it's great. Everybody was like, kind of like the Dynamo. It was just, <laughs> there was 30,000 there. Do you find it, do you find it um, at all ironic that a band like Metallica, met one of many bands influenced by you, are now that much higher above you and that you've come back kind of supporting them? Is that kind of ironic? How do you see it? Uh, not really, you know. It's like, you know, they've, they've been going at it all the time. Merciful Fate stopped at a certain point, you know, where we might have taken it further as well. We don't know that. And uh, I don't even want to look back and say, oh, I'm so sorry, maybe we could have done that, you know, there's no regrets. We, we did what we did and we couldn't go on because there was different opinions on the musical style between Hank Sherman and me. Mm -hmm. And uh, now he's, he's back in his heaviest style ever. And mm -hmm. uh, it's like we've discussed a lot of things before we even started this whole project with Merciful Fate again. And uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that King Diamond's not going to continue because we are, we already have the next album written. We're just looking for a deal in America right now. So, uh, but we're going to give 100% for Mercial Fate and there's going to be more albums for Mercial Fate too. So uh, we're going to go 100% tour as much as we can for this album. Whenever we can't tour anymore this new album, then uh, it's time for King Diamond to go in the studio and do one. So the new album is called Into the Shadows and it's out a little bit later this month. Very quickly, preview of that album? It's very genuine Mercial Fate. There's no doubt when you hear it, you'll be taken back to almost 85 style-wise. The sound is definitely updated, much better production all this, but uh, it's Mercial Fate the whole way through, there's no doubt about it. And I think all the members are really have learned a lot from being away from the band and doing different things. They got way better skill now. I can hear that on the album, they're playing much better. So they, right. Hank has been involved in some AOR kind of poppier version, you know, of stuff. A band and uh, it's it's done him some good obviously oh, so yeah. it's 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 good we feel really good about it now. Okay. And you're based in Los Angeles now, aren't you? Uh, Dallas, Texas. And you're happy about being over in the states? Actually, yeah, I, it's it's very nice there. I used to live in LA at a time, but it was <laughs> not quite my scene. All right then, King Diamond. Thank you very much for talking to us. I'm going to let you go off and enjoy the rest of the Metallica gig. You can hear it there in the background behind us. We're going to have another short break right now, and then after that, we'll be back talking to Megadeth. So stay tuned. Thanks, to King Diamond. Okay, we're back with Megadeth on the Headbangers Ball from Metallica at Milton Keynes and uh, Dave Mustaine is still with me and also Dave Junior, Junior Dave and uh, we just asked uh, Dave number one his uh, feelings on the gig tonight. How about you Dave Junior, how did it go for you? <laughs> there you go with that Junior thing again, I should have never said anything. Dave uh, number two. Yeah, right. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty good gig. It was kind of hard to tell the response. There were so many people out there that it was hard to tell how everything was until we finished up with Anarchy, and I guess that was kind of the clincher. It, it was, a, it was, you know, it's kind of a little rough. We played Nottingham, Rock City, the other night, so to go from that 1,500 to like 60,000 is quite the difference. But I was very happy to be playing on that stage. Right. How did cool. you feel on that Metallica stage with the big pit in the middle? <laughs> We wondered well, how the hell they move around on it, actually. <laughs> I felt like I was standing, uh, like I should be taking a pee, and I was standing in front of something with a big <laughs> hole right there. Like I should be. So what do you want this gig to say about Megadeth in 1993? Because... <laughs> how the hell am I supposed to know? I don't know what I wanted to say. I wanted to say uh, whatever anybody can say. You kind of see it as like public, publicly burying the hatchet with Metallica? 
or is that something just that the press have kind of made a big deal of? With me, the hatchet was buried a long time ago. People just, you know, let that shit go on. So are you going to get up with them tonight and play? Excuse me? Are you going to go on stage with Metallica tonight? No. All right, well, let's move on then, because uh, Dave M, Dave number one, you actually also contributed to, to Diamond Head's album. Was uh, that very special for you to take part on that? Yeah, it was. It was nice. Did you play guitar, and also, was it produced as well? Uh, yeah, yeah it, was, it was really nice. It was a good opportunity for me. Because I know that they were like one of your favorite bands as well, weren't they? Yeah, they were. One of many, yeah. <laughs> but one of the cooler ones. Okay, um, now we showed a video a few weeks ago, a few days ago on Headbangers Ball and that was the remixes of uh, Symphony of Destruction done by Trent Reznor. Now how did that come about? Were you pleased with the results? I, I liked it, I mean, they, uh, as we said before, we, we liked a lot of the industrial music when it first came out, especially Nine Inch Nails, and it was suggested that we give it to Trent to see what he can do with it, just, you know, kind of as an experiment, and we, when we got it back, it was cool. There's actually two versions of it. There's the, 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 the regular length version, and another version that he added on a whole outro that he tagged onto it, but I actually like the video a lot for it. Yeah. I like the conductor. You take a mortal man and put him in control Watch him become a god Watch people's heads are wrong
also um, been involved in writing a new song for is it the last action hero soundtrack now how did that come about did you actually know about the film and write the song or was it something you already had in sort of on the go it was a yeah uh, it's, it, it's a new film that's going to be out i think in july over here from what i've heard um Apparently Arnold Schwarzenegger wanted us to do a song for it, and, and he wanted new material for it, so we didn't just use some throwaway stuff from, from Countdown. We, we went in and we, we wrote a song, recorded it, and uh, we just finished the video for it about a week ago, right before we came over here to do this. So. They, they, we saw like a little uh, synopsis of the script, you know, to kind of get an idea what the movie was about, but rather than, we already did that once with Go to Hell for the Bill and Ted movie. We kind of like wrote a song around the idea of the movie, and then they changed the title for it. Because that title was going to be Go to Hell. So rather than like do that with this movie, uh, as we were in the studio actually, Dave changed the lyrics the day he was tracking the vocals. And the idea of the lyrics, Angry Again, concept and title fit great with the lyrics, so it, with, the, with the music. So we actually changed it right then. So you played it tonight, didn't you? How did it go down, the new song? It went. It's okay. I mean, you know, nobody really knows how it goes, so they're kind of going. They were listening. Have you had a chance to work on any other new material apart from that? Plenty. We've got all kinds of new stuff. Okay. And what are Megadeth's plans for the immediate future in the next few weeks? After we do these uh, Metallica shows this week, we're going to be going back to uh, <laughs> I get a little cracker. Gonna, uh, we're doing uh, uh, some shows with Pantera supporting us in the United States, and then we're going out for about 10 weeks with Daryl Smith, supporting them on, on a couple legs of their U.S. tour. Dave, just then you were telling me that you, you're not skydiving anymore. Why, why is that? I've been there, done that. But you miss it? Well, when we go to Florida, I'm going to wrestle an alligator. <laughs> That's your next challenge? Yeah. Well, thanks very much to both of you for talking to us again on Headbangers Ball. It's great to see you again. And uh, right now we're going to finish off with some more Megadeth live performance. And then, of course, a little bit later on, we're going to be meeting up with the headliners, Metallica. So stay tuned as the Headbangers Ball continues.
Megadeth live on stage here at Milton Keynes and uh, as you can see the sun is setting and the stage is set in fact for Metallica. They're on stage right now as I speak which leads me nicely to tell you that after the next short break we are going to be meeting up with Metallica with an interview recorded a little earlier today before they took to the famous Milton Keynes Bowl stage. And also you may like to know that Metallica are our band of the week on page 280 of MTV Tech. So for more information check that out and we're also running a competition for some winners to win some Metallic cans, these limited edition cans full to the brim with Metallica goodies. So that's running through page 280 of MTV Text. Check it out and stay tuned for the headliners Metallica and I guarantee you it's total Metallica meltdown. Welcome back to the Headbangers Ball where we have reached the highlight of our entire program. It's time for Total Metallica Meltdown. And you know this guy who's joined me, James. I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you to Headbangers Ball because last time in Birmingham you weren't very well. So I'm very glad to see you well today. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah. better mood. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Now, um, there were rumours that Metallica might headline Donington, although we heard that there wasn't a Donington this year after all. What are the pros and cons of headlining your own show rather than doing a big sort of famous festival like that? Uh, well, it, it's good to see that people are coming to the show because it's Metallica, not just because it's a Donington thing, which is an event in itself, you know. But it's good to see a lot of uh, crazy people here to see, uh, you know, the good music that's going on today. Well, it's a great lineup. Everybody agrees that. Um, when you were in the big arenas, you had the Metallic film. Now, do you think that these um, opening bands, the Almighty, we can hear behind us, do you think that they're an important part of the outdoor vibe? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. The film wouldn't, wouldn't really work outside, would it? Well, I mean, everyone's seen the, the film, and I've seen it, and it's, you know, we know what we look like, and everyone else does too now. So <laughs> no, it's good to have some, uh, some bands up there rocking and getting people uh, happening out there. It's very um, good of you to allow bands to use the whole stage and everything. I think some of them are a bit... What? They are? <laughs> no snake fit today, though. No. Uh, that's our thing. That's your thing. <laughs> right. Um, do you... Do you um, the, now, the Metallica album obviously allowed you to get a lot of things of, off your chest, um, but your life has changed so much over the last two years. I was wondering, do those subjects and experiences seem to you like they're from like another era of your life? like two years ago or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> well all I mean all the all the lyrics on every album uh, you, like when you go back and listen to them or read them again there's like a whole new meaning to the things might yeah it might be something completely different but uh, uh, yeah I mean I feel like there's a, something missing inside me now because I need to kind of create new stuff again which we will probably be doing soon when we get back so I mean, are these new songs from the Metallica album, are they still really fresh to play live two years down the line? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'll, I'll actually listen to the thing too. I'll put the record on. <laughs> and also, I guess playing live, they're a little bit shorter and maybe a bit simpler. Does that help as well? Well, that, that definitely works better. I mean, it makes the set list look more impressive, you know? <laughs> wow, <laughs> 20 songs now. <laughs> All right, well, July the 4th is the big day, the final Metallica show on this tour. 15 to go. I'm not counting though. So are you looking forward to the final one? Or are you hanging in there? We're, everyone's in a great mood. I mean, everyone can see the end. And so everyone is, is really hepped up. I mean, everyone, crew, band, you know, the whole thing. So you're going to have a big party on the final night. You don't know <laughs> us very well. Yes, of course. <laughs> but, uh, how, I mean, how are you going to switch off from all this Metallica activity? What are you going to do in, in your free time? I don't know. It's going to be a bit scary. You know? <laughs> I'll wait for the wake-up sheet to come under the door. You know? <laughs> what do I do today? Well, you'll be waiting a long time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It'll take at least a month to kind of wind down and figure out that you're really at home. Do you feel like you've got roots at home? Oh, definitely. Yeah. So you right. go back to that and like totally switch off and then come back? Yeah, I, that's what I try to do. You go home and hang out with your, your friends and, and you know shut Metallica off. But I mean, it takes at least a, 
a week or two to wind down from the from the damn thing and then you know we've only been home uh like two weeks at a time so uh, there's no real time to kind of really relax you know <laughs> understand um so we're you were talking there about winding down for this break you've got coming up but really right now you're winding up for tonight Hell yeah so, well how are you feeling about tonight oh very good i mean everyone like i was saying is in a great mood and you know i think we got some pretty rocking bands going on here but it's great to see you in a good mood thank you hey, very hey. much all right <laughs> thanks very much to james and right now we're going to show you a little bit of metallica live here at milton Keynes. I'm not, I'm very sunny too. No, we're all in a really good mood. I'm, uh, when I woke up this morning, I was like, yay, it's finally here. Let's do it. Let's get on with it. And we came down here. We saw Diamond Head, watched a little bit of these guys, Almighty, which I'm sure you've heard of. And, uh, and I'm in a really good mood, which is scary. Good, good. Let's talk a little bit about the Metallica live show because you're winding up the end of two years on the road. Um, how do you feel that the band on the live show has progressed and developed over those two years? Steadily worse. Uh, no, no, it's um, pretty much gone up most of the way. Um, we're playing a lot better than we obviously were two years ago. We know what we're doing a lot more. We had a little bit of a period in like maybe February, March into early April where we were in a little bit of a lull. But uh, we're now, since we started this European leg three weeks ago, we're playing probably the best we have in the last two years. We threw a couple of new songs in there, Brilliant. moved the set around a little bit and so on. So right now I feel better than I have the last two years. Brilliant. I'm sure you're uh, winding up for July the 4th as well, the final date on the tour. July 4th is now uh, four weeks, six minutes, 15 12 shows. seconds. Uh, yeah. um, let's talk a little bit. Um, have you had to compromise the staging in produc and production in any way to accommodate these support bands today? Um, no, not really. I mean, the whole thing that we've been doing here for the last three weeks has been uh, two or three support acts in every place and um, we have some of the better things from the indoor gig like the snake pit mm -hmm. and James has you know 46 microphones and all that stuff so it's uh, it, it doesn't really we have some very good production people that move things around and mm -hmm. drums kits get shoved up where they're supposed to go and it, it's all very smooth and it's um, so we have our full production thing that we had with um, when we were co-headlining last summer with guns and it uh, We've added a couple things to it, but it's, uh, it's working really well. But the Snake Pit's only open for business with Metallica, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, yes, I'm sorry. That's, uh, 
No, I think oh, some well, of the yeah. bands are a little worried about all the well, ramps and the walkways and going out the front there. Well, I can understand somebody who's never been on that stage before. It's like, what's this big gaping hole in the <laughs> middle of the stage? Just to, maybe we should put like a security net down there. But, uh, you know, all the, we've had the cult and suicidal with us in um, over Europe the last three weeks and nobody's fallen in, nobody's gotten hurt. And it's, uh, it's working really well, so I'm happy. Good, that's great. Um, will this show be particularly special for you, bearing in mind that Diamond Head are on the bill and you know, you've know you long been a great fan of the band and always spoken up for them, so. Flying the flag, yeah, it's uh, it's great. I mean, the fact that, that these two guys are standing over here clowning around and, and I just saw them play for about 25 minutes was amazing. Also, I should say that last week when we played in Copenhagen, we had Merciful, Merciful Fate, Fate which was the other favorite. band. Yeah. You know, the three bands that really influenced early Metallica was Diamond Head, Merciful Fate, and, and Motorhead. So the fact that we've played with all those bands now in the last few months, we had Motorhead with us on the Guns Tour last summer. But seeing Merciful Fate last week open for us, Diamond Head today, I feel like I'm 12 years old, you know, <laughs> like a little punter running around going, yay! Oh, brilliant. It's great. It's yeah. really good. And it's a great day today, and it's just couldn't ask for for a better setup. Good. Well, there is some things we've got to talk about. Very important things. Uh -oh. Forthcoming live video and ah! uh, no, sorry, forthcoming live album and home video. Tell us a little bit about those. Um, let's see. Where do we start? I think the best way to is, is some of you guys out there might be familiar with a couple years ago, Queens right, did like this little like package, kind of a mm -hmm. box thing that had some videos and CDs or cassettes with their configuration yep. that you bought. That's the idea we're going with. We're not trying to do like, you know, a single album, a double album, a single video, a double video, and a, another CD with a different cover and three other songs. It's like one package. If you want this thing, you have one option. You buy the whole thing. It's gonna have about. Um, it's gonna have about two. I'm seeing all these people everywhere. I know I'm sitting here waving to everybody. It's gonna have. Uh, um, the whole show on video from San Diego early in the tour and about half hour of stuff from the Justice Tour from Seattle yeah. in 89 of all the songs that we didn't play and so on on this tour and it's got a whole show on CDs and and cassettes or whatever configuration that you buy from Mexico City mm -hmm. later in the tour and you can see it's two different set lists it's two different you know we're playing a lot better obviously as the tour moves on and so on it's going to be you know have the usual 712 live photos and <laughs> all that kind of stuff so it's going to be a great the definitive live Metallica pack. It's, it's not going to be so much for all the people that just know Metallica from, you know, Enter Sandman or whatever, but it's going to be for the fans that have been with us for the last 12 years and so on. I think for them it's going to be something that they really get off on. Okay, well, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next segment, but right now we're going to show you a little bit more of Metallica as they are at their best. Here they are live.
with me on the Headbangers Ball, waving to all his friends backstage <laughs> at Milton Keynes. There's a great atmosphere back here, actually. And Lars, we were just talking in the last segment about the forthcoming live album and accompanying home video, and you being such a knowledgeable rock fan, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree that a lot of live albums have been a pivotal point in some bands' career, like Kiss, Alive, and Deep Purple, Made in Japan. Um, do you see that with Metallica, or is it like closing one chapter, ready to start a new one? <laughs> I wish I could be that philosophical about it. It's just like, we've got all this stuff lying around in all our storage facilities. It's time to clean. No, I mean, on a more serious note, it's, um, it's gonna be a long time until the next Metallica record comes around. And I think that we just feel that it, like, it's a good time right now to just push some of this out. <laughs> more people to wave to. Hi, Mick. How are you? <laughs> That's Mick. <laughs> That's Mick. Anyway, <laughs> what was I talking about? Sorry. Do um, you think it's important to make a clean out all your well, backlog yeah. kind of thing? We just, you know, we have so much footage lying around. We have all these shows from the Justice to all this stuff from the last couple of years. And I just think that now is a good time. We really want to take a couple of years away from the spotlight. We really want to just be low key. We want, you know, and so on. It just seems right now is a perfect time mm -hmm. to just release this kind of thing. Like I said to you in the last segment, yeah. it's not something for. You know, it's not like something we think is going to sell as many no. as the last. It's just for the, for dedicated the, fan, for the fans who've yeah. been there, and and it's like our thing to them, and and blah blah blah. And I just also I don't think that necessarily maybe live albums mean as much as they used to. If you think back to the 70s, like yeah. you were talking about, you're made in Japan's and so on. Now with the the advent of, of videos and what kind of role that plays in it, it's just like. It's just live albums par se, a live album just by itself. Nobody really does that anymore. It's always a live album and a video, and everybody always pays more attention to the video and so on. So I think we're trying to combine the best of both worlds and stuff like that by giving everybody different shows and so on. And it, um, hey, we're just doing ours. It, uh, hey, like I said, we're cleaning, we're cleaning the attic out. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have been on the road for two years, which is a tremendous amount of time by anybody's standards. I mean, how have you managed to kind of keep your feet on the ground do you think that you, you it seems to me that you've maybe got a little bit of a cynical sense of humor do well, you think that's helped yeah. that's um that's the best thing that we i mean i finally realize now why we are so cynical and, and why we have this very silly s sense of humor it's actually very british as you can probably relate to but yeah. i think it, it's to keep all the kind of seriousness a little bit at a distance yeah. if you let all this get to you and sit down and oh you know one of the biggest bands in the world and 300 concerts and MTV and big stadium shows and all that, it, it can get a bit much. So we try and approach it all with a really, really loose attitude and as you're saying, very sarcastic and very <laughs> cynical. And it, I think at the end of the day, it helps us get through. I think it also pisses a lot of people <laughs> off that don't quite understand our sense of humor <laughs> and so on. But um, at the end of the day, it's what works best for us and it's the reason that we can be out here and do this. Mm -hmm. And um, for any band to go out and play 310 gigs on a tour, you know, there have to be something wrong with them. And uh, and uh, the well, fact Well, your way of keeping sane, I really. No, it, um, I don't know, without giving you all these corny stories about, you know, the road is really home to us and all this <laughs> crap everybody else tells you. It just, I'm very happy that we're in a position where we have an album that's big enough to allow us to go out and play 310 gigs and to do 25 Milton Keynes across Europe and, and so on and so forth. And that's a situation that doesn't present itself to you all that often. So we're basically doing it here why anybody cares because when we come back in three years with another album, I mean, who knows? It's so unpredictable these days. Maybe everybody will just say, yeah, Metallica, <laughs> you know, next. Not. <laughs> well. Anyway, very quickly, um, I know lots of fans want to know what is happening with your fan club. So many people are writing into us for an address. What's happening? <sighs> I thought I could get out of this clean. Um, the fan club. Well, what happened was on the last couple of records, there were some addresses printed that were uh, that were some um, people that were appointed by the uh, merchandising company to run these things that weren't doing good enough jobs. So we basically pulled it. We're in the process right now of trying to set up a fan club with people that we trust. I mean, obviously we get zillions of letters and it's very difficult to keep up with all of it, but we are in the process of trying to when the tour is over to sit down and deal with this issue and um like i said we have somebody who we trust very much who we're talking to right now about right. basically overseeing it and setting it up when the tour is over so that's the latest i can right. give you now okay. so and you'll keep us posted on that i hope okay Absolutely. now as we said july the 4th is the last 
day at the Tuhauk Vöckta Festival. And then how on earth are you, of all people, going to put all this Metallica behind you and go back to being living a normal life for I, a little I, while? I like the way you say that. Me of all people, <laughs> right? Um, because it is your life, isn't it, Lars? I have no life and I have nothing else. Um, no, in all seriousness, it. I think it's going to be okay. Um, I think the last few months I've, um, I've started to feel the way any other normal human being would under these circumstances, which is pretty burnt out. And the only thing that's really keeping us going is the fact that we get up on stage three or four times a week and play some really good shows. Um, I think it's going to be okay. I mean, people that know me, like you're just saying, people, it's like, I'm going to take a year off. People start laughing in my face. It's like, oh, excuse me. But uh, like I said, I've, I'm in a really solid situation now at home, both mm -hmm. relationship-wise and blah, blah, blah. And I just feel, I feel ready to undertake this whole thing. I really feel that for the first time in my life that I can let Metallica go to the point of, of, of getting totally away from it for up to a year. But maybe we'll come back in three months and give you some <laughs> new exclusive on some, you know, Metallica are playing three nights on the moon, you know, so I, mean, I don't know what's going to happen. That's what I kind of caution everybody. It's like, remember this is Metallica you're talking to and it's like there are no rules other than Metallica rules and whatever's going to happen and whatever, if we take six months off, nine months off, a year, if we take a year and a half, it's like, Whatever we're in a position now where we have nobody telling us what to do, which is obviously a great situation to be in. So I, I feel, I feel really good about the next year or so. It's uh, it's gonna be nice to just have some time to yourself. Mm -hmm. So have you been able to write anything on the road, or are you gonna just leave it for a year or however long it you feel to write for, and then get back to it? Zero. That was what I was doing. Zero. Zero. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Um. We really we we are one of these bands that don't subscribe to the theory of sound checks. We've probably done. I'd say five or ten shot town checks on this tour, and uh, which means that we don't really jam all that much. You know, we sometimes sit in the tuning room, a little riff comes up here and there, but generally, we don't really bother that much with all that. So when we've taken some time off, we're going to sit down and shift through all the stuff again and, and come up with ten or twelve new songs. And right now, there is really nothing. So uh, <laughs> that's all I can tell you. <laughs> on Metallica as we speak here at Milton Keynes Bowl. Forthcoming live album accompanying home video. Then when the tour finishes on the 4th of July, the band are going to take some time off. Nobody knows how much before they uh, start getting back together again and start writing for the next album. So uh, your thoughts about tonight, Lars? There's a gig a little bit later. Oh, <laughs> I thought I was just here punting around. <laughs> uh, it's going to be great. I mean, what can I say? Look at this day. It's. Uh, it's been a great three or four hours so far. Like I said, I'm in a great mood. James is in a great mood. This is all very scary. So uh, it's going to be good. It's going to be real good. There's 60,000 people out there. The fact that we can come back to England and play to 60,000 people in one go is incredible. So it, um, it's going to be good. I feel real good about it. All right, then. Well, thanks very much, Lars, for taking time to talk to us. It's great to see everybody in the Metallic camp in such a great, great mood to go with the weather. I want to ask her something, OK? So what do you think of the Almighty? Oh no, don't do that. <laughs> oh, didn't you see him? They just played for 45 minutes. What have you been doing all this well, time? I was interviewing Metallica. You don't have anything better to do with your time than that? Um, <laughs> I can't answer that. Anyway, I and uh, we're signing answer. off now from Milton Keynes. We're going to the, what's the next segment? Well, actually, we've reached the end of the show. Oh, we reached the end of the show. So yeah. it's so time to... Would you like to, to say goodbye? Uh, would I like to say good, good, goodbye? Yeah. You should go in and ask your husband how he's doing. I would like to.
I'll sit here and, and talk to these guys and I'll close off. Can I just tell you what's happening next week? We're in the studio, back in the studio. Hope you've enjoyed the show. I'll leave you with Lars to say good night. I'll see you next week. Okay, see ya. All right, now we got her out of the way. Let the fun begin. I have a gig to do. I got to go up on stage in a few minutes. So it was good hanging with you guys, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>